Hello and welcome to video 3 for week 7. In this video I wanted to find the other components of the calculus of parametric curves and this is going to give us a really complete language for talking about motion particularly in three-dimensional spaces which is the application I want to talk about most in this particular video. Let me say that I'm trying to describe essentially three kinds of motion. I can have straight motion, motion in a straight line. I have a fixed direction, variable speed, you can move slowly or, or quickly, but the direction never changes. I can also have curving motion, where I fix a plane of motion, but in that plane of motion I can curve around. Think about orbits that stay in a certain plane, but have a curved path in that plane. And I can also think of twisting motion. In that sense, I can curve in this plane, but I can also sort of twist my motion to change the plane that I'm curving in. And in that way, by sort of twisting the angles of my curving, I can reach any point in three-dimensional space. So straight motion is motion that's confined to a line. Curving motion is motion that's confined to a plane. And then twisting motion is motion that can get anywhere in three-dimensional space by changing the plane in which it is currently, currently curving. This threefold description is going to underpin all of what's going to go on in this video for the calculus of parametric curves. Straight motion was defined basically by speed and the direction of motion. We got both of those things from the tangent. Curvature we're going to get by going further than the tangent. So we defined the tangent gamma prime, and we also defined the unit tangent, capital T. So I can actually still differentiate this and see what happens to the change in the direction of motion. So the unit tangent was the direction of motion. If I differentiate it, I get the change in the direction of motion. And it turns out, as I mentioned at the end of the last video, to do this properly, we have to sort of define things in the arc length parameter, because the arc length parameter is a unique parameter we can define for each parametric curve. So the formal definition of curvature, which is represented with this weird K, which is the Greek letter kappa, is the rate of change of the unit tangent in the arc length parameter. Thankfully, we can calculate it in any parameterization we want. We just have to scale by the length of the tangent vector. So the curvature of a parametric curve is the change in its unit tangent vector scaled by the speed. Let me give some examples to, what, to, to really give the idea of what I mean by the change in the unit tangent vector, the change in the direction of motion. So here is a straight line in three dimensions. It's moving at some rate, a, b, and c, but it goes in some fixed direction. We can see that in its tangent direction is just a, b, and c, and its speed is also fixed here. So if I take the unit tangent that's taking the tangent, dividing by its length, capital T is going to be this vector, and this vector is constant, so this is straight motion of fixed speed. I want to differentiate this, but if I differentiate constant, I get zero. And the curvature is defined to be the length of this divided by the length of the tangent. So the curvature is this piece divided by this piece. Uh, the length of zero, 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 zero divided by whatever is still zero. The curvature of the straight line is zero. That's good. We're trying to find something called curvature. A straight line should have no curvature. That makes sense. Let's define a circle in R2 parametric curve for a circle. Hopefully that is becoming familiar. Cos t sine t. Differentiate, I get negative sine t cos t. The length of this is the square root of sine squared plus cos squared, which is 1. So if I take this and divide by the length as 1, this is already the unit tangent. Remember, the unit tangent is the tangent divided by its length. And I differentiate the unit tangent. I get derivative of negative sine is negative cos. Derivative of cos is negative sine. The length of this is again a square root of sine squared plus cos squared, so the length of this is 1, the length of this is 1. The curvature is the ratio of those two things. The curvature of the unit circle is 1, and that gives us a scale for curvature. What does curvature 1 mean? It means how quickly the unit circle is curving. Well, let's look at a circle of radius a. What's the curvature of a circle of radius a? Well, the circle of radius a is given by a cos t, a sine t. Take the derivative of both the components, look at the length. Well, there's a's here now, so I'm going to get a squared plus a squared sine plus squared plus cos squared is 1. So I just get square root of a squared, I get a here. If I divide this by a, the unit tangent is just negative sine t cos t. So moving around this thing, I have a tangent 
and then I have a unit tangent, which is just the direction scaled so that this a doesn't in, doesn't in fact affect the unit tangent. It's just the direction negative sine t cos t like it was with the unit circle. I differentiate this again, derivative of the sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine. I take the length of this, the length of this is one, but the length of gamma prime up here was a, so my curvature is one over a. This also tells us how curvature scales. Curvature is inversely proportional to radius, and that makes sense. If I have a circle of very small radius, then I'm going around this circle very, very quickly. It's curving very, very tightly. It should have high curvature. If I have a large circle, and then in terms of local movement, moving along this circle from here to here, I'm not actually curving very much. It looks almost like a straight line, where from here to here I do a lot of curving. Very much like on the surface of the Earth, things look relatively flat, and that's because the radius of the Earth is so large. So curvature is inversely proportional to radius. So if I say a curvature of 3, you should think of moving around a circle with radius 1 third. If I say a curvature of 1 quarter, you should think about moving around a circle with radius 4. Curvature is a scalar. I'd also like to take the derivative of the unit tangent and think of that as a vector, and I can take its unit vector as well. t of t was the unit tangent. It told me the direction of movement. Its derivative may not be a unit vector anymore. It might in fact be zero, but I can scale it by its length and get a new unit vector, and this vector is going to tell me the direction of the curvature. If I'm moving this way, I could curve that way, I could curve that way, so I get different directions of curvature. This vector n is going to tell me Am I curving left? Am I curving right? And since it can point in any direction, it's always going to be perpendicular to t. There's a theorem that proves that, that I mentioned briefly in the notes. But it's going to tell me what direction in three-dimensional space I'm going to curve. And then once I have these three vectors, I can also define a vector b. The vector n is called the normal. The vector b, which is the cross product of those two previous things, is called the binormal. And then the span of the tangent and the normal vector is called the oscillating plane. That's a lot of terminology. Let me talk about what this means in a visual example. So I've now defined three vectors. These are always unit vectors. Capital T, capital N, and capital B will always be vectors of length one. And we can prove that. Uh, I mentioned again briefly a lemma in the notes. I'm not going to prove it here in the video. The tangent Unit tangent is the local direction of movement. So as I'm moving along this helix, at this point here, if all forces change and it, the object was just left to continue with its momentum, it would keep moving in this direction. The direction n is the direction of curvature that tells me this thing is curving in that direction. So it's pointing sort of, sort of to the inside of this helix. If you've got a helix-like shape, things are always curving towards the inside of the helix. And then these two define a plane. So t and n define a plane, and that is the local plane of curvature. At that moment in time, that direction and that curvature says it's sort of moving in this tilted plane, and planes are described by normals, so b of t is the normal to that plane, giving a good description of that plane. And this gives us three vectors. These are all perpendicular to each other. These are all vectors of length 1 that sort of completely describe the various directions of motion, the direction of, mo uh, uh, of linear motion, the direction of curvature, and the direction of the plane that is currently curving in. It's a really nice visualization of all of the directions involved in the motion of a parametric curve, and they're all given by just taking derivatives and perhaps second derivatives in clever ways of the original parametric curve. Do make sure you keep track of the definitions of all these things. They're all in the notes. There's a lot of definitions in this video. This is a pretty heavy and hectic video, so make use of the notes for reference for what b and n and t are defined to be, but they all come from the original curve gamma. No additional information is given. It's all just things we do to the coordinates of gamma to get this information. Lastly, we had speed, we had curvature, we have one last scalar that tells us what's going on. So we had this oscillating plane defined by the tangent and the normal. It's 
its normal direction is the binormal vector b. So the vector b tells us by the perpendicular direction what plane we are currently curving in. Torsion is this last kind of motion I talked about at the start of the video, the twisting motion, and it's going to be defined by changing the plane of curvature. So since b told us about the plane of curvature, the rate of change of the plane of curvature, the absolute value of that, defined in the arc length parameter, because that's sort of the, the most intrinsic way to do it, is a number called torsion, and it's given the Greek letter tau. And if you wanted to calculate it in terms of a general parameterization, gamma of t, and you can calculate it by differentiating the binormal, taking the dot product with the normal, this is an actual dot product of vectors, and then scaling by negative 1 divided by the length of the tangent vector, the speed of the curve. That's how you calculate it. What does it mean? This is the slide that hopefully sums up what's going on. So I have a description of motion. Everything comes from gamma of t by taking derivatives, taking lengths of vectors, taking more derivatives, taking more lengths of vectors, but it's all just manipulations of gamma of t. I get three directions, the tangent, normal, and binormal direction tell me the direction of motion, the direction of curvature, and the normal to the plane of curvature. And I have three scalars. I have speed, I have curvature, and I have torsion. So let me try and summarize the kinds of motion I had before by talking about what happens when those are all zero or non-zero constants. If all of those are zero, I have no movement. There's no speed, there's no curvature, there's no torsion, nothing's happening. If I have movement, a constant movement, but no curvature, no torsion, I'm moving in a straight line. If I have constant movement, so constant speed and constant curvature, but no torsion, I'm moving in a circle. And if the curvature here is non-constant, I can get things like elliptical and parabolic and hyperbolic orbits as well. So think of that no torsion as the kind of orbital mechanic motion moving in a fixed plane in three-dimensional space. It could be all sorts of planes, planes at some angle, but moving in a fixed plane. And lastly, if all three of these are constant, I get a helix. So you can think of what's a constant twisting, twist, twisting motion. The helix is constantly changing its plane of curvature. If its plane of curvature were fixed, it would just be a circle, but it's not a circle. It twists off the circle and keeps twisting to keep gaining or losing altitude as you go up or down the helix. And in that way, the three scalars, speed, curvature, and torsion, can collectively sort of define everything we need to know in a moment about motion in three-dimensional space. If we know the speed and the direction, if we know the curvature and the direction of curvature, if we know the torsion and the direction of torsion, which is the change in the oscillating plane, then we know everything about how an object is going to move in three-dimensional space. And that's really the goal, at least three-dimensionally, of the calculus of parametric curves.